They lit the whole um, house um, so that I could just go through and they made everything like they were like, you can destroy whatever you want. Because I remember the first season I broke something and everybody freaked out and they're like, okay, you're going to hurt yourself. So like, we got to make sure everything is safe. And they're like, you can break whatever. I wasn't supposed to break the door, but you know, things oh, happen, wow. <laughs> but you know, um, that scene was unbelievable. I watched it that 10 minute. It, I watched it twice. Like in, I rewind it because it was just, I mean, when we were talking, we're talking about self-awareness. I mean, there was no self and there was no self-awareness, but you were in total control of the scene at the same time. And it was, it was just, it was just, it was just like, oh, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's a pro. Hey everyone, welcome to the SAG After Foundation conversation. My name is Scott Mance and I will be moderating this conversation. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to have a conversation with three of the nominees, the three of the SAG nominees for Outstanding Female Actor in a Drama Series, all three giving powerful tour de force performances that absolutely made watching TV an incredible experience over the last year. I'm going to welcome playing Rupe Bennett, Zendaya on Euphoria. How you doing, Zendaya? Uh, also good. joining us is uh, Julia Garner playing Ruth Langmore on Ozark and Elizabeth Debicki for playing Princess Diana on season five of The Crown. Welcome everybody, congratulations on your nominations, your recognition and your success. And Julie, I want to start with you because we are in the fourth and final season of Ozark. What were the unique challenges that went into season four, even though you had already been doing this for seasons one, two, and three? Um, I mean, there are so many challenges ending a show. Um, as simple as just saying goodbye to everybody. I mean, we had the same cat, like, crew every single day uh, for the last five years. Um, but I also just think ending in a way where you're still making everybody want more, but, but still ending it in, in a graceful, in a graceful way. Um, yeah. It's, it's a weird thing to end a TV show because it's just such a big part of your life for so long. So in a way, I feel like after I do like all these panels, then then that's that's the, this is like the final goodbye of Ozark in, in a weird way. Yeah, it's like goodbye and we mean it. <laughs> we mean it this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, you know, I feel very grateful that I got to do that for five years. So. Oh, a absolutely. You know, Zendaya, uh, so season three of Euphoria is unfolding as we speak uh, on HBO and HBO Max, but getting into season two, after just diving in deep into season one, what were what were the new challenges that that you faced going into season two? And, and we'll get into a particular episode later into this conversation. <laughs> um, I just want to start by saying that, like, you guys are incredible. I've watched both of you, and I'm a fan. <laughs> so I just want to start there. Um, same. But it's the same for both of you too. <laughs> you guys are I'm like, I'm, I'm so fascinated. I'm so excited about this conversation because just also as an audience, just to hear what you guys, your process of it. I mean, I just have so much respect for you both and what you guys do. So. I feel the exact same way. So <laughs> I'm very excited to be talking to both of you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in any kind of television experience, like there, when there's a first season and when it goes the best you feel like it could go and you put your heart into it and it's received and people, you know, feel connected to, to the characters that you've been able to create and the work that you've done. That's a really special feeling. And then you go into season two and it's just like, there's a, a little bit of a fear, I think, um, because you don't want to let anybody down. And um, now the kind of ownership of your character that you used to have, now you feel like you share them a little bit with people and their experiences, especially something so like intimate. Um, and so for us at, over at Euphoria, it was about trying to walk into it without any fear and giving ourselves the time, which 
in a weird way ended up happening with COVID because we were supposed to shoot what was a very different season of Euphoria before and then after. Um, it went through like so many different versions and then we obviously ended on, on what, what kind of came out. But I think it was just kind of walking into it without trying to compare ourselves to ourselves and, and just try to view it from the perspective of just the characters and where they need to go and what they need to feel and, um, and where they are in their lives and just kind of live more inside of it rather than I think us looking at ourselves from the outside, which is much um, easier said than done. Um, and it was, it was special, you know, it kind of gave us the time to, to experiment. I think during the, um, the pandemic, we did like these two in between episodes because we really missed these characters so much. And we wanted to like live with them for a moment um, because we hadn't seen them for so long. Um, and that allowed us to like work within the confines of COVID and explore what euphoria looks like within some kind of parameters mm -hmm. and uh, experiment with, with pace and, um, literally just be with two characters in a diner. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was really fun because I think it, it took the pressure off a little bit. And so when we went back for the third season, um, it felt a little less scary. Um, yeah. And we ended up just having, I think, a lot of fun um, and trying to let go of those kind of preconceived ideas about what we should do or shouldn't do, you know? Absolutely. No, that's a great way to put it. Um, and especially, I'm really curious about how the, the sort of COVID made just sort of change course with shooting. I'll get to that in a moment. But, uh, you know, Elizabeth, your situation is really unique because here you are on season five of a series in which everyone on this cast for season five is all new. So how, how do you, how does everyone approach that? Like, what were the conversations that you had, you know, with Peter Morgan after you had someone like Emma Corinne play a character like Diana, and now you're carrying the torch and moving forward with her. Can I do my little love fest bit first as well? Just to <laughs> <laughs> that feels necessary. And it's, it's like just so beautiful to meet you guys and talk to you. I just think you're extraordinary and it's, it's very real. Um, you know, it was, um, it was really the strangest job of my life today without a doubt. It's so many layers deep, the challenge for me, it was part of sort of like joining a show that you have watched as an audience and loved and like really genuinely just watched it. And my, one of my best friends played Princess Margaret in the first two seasons. So I just watched it as this, you know, and then I auditioned for that part and I knew in a funny way, I kind of, I knew I was going to play it for a very long time, like nearly four or five years. So that that's a really kind of weird challenge in itself because it's cooking somewhere in the back of your mind, but you don't want to come to it too early. And, and so that's, mm -hmm. I guess it's a sort of challenge of pacing that one in particular. And then there's a real, very deep responsibility we felt as a cast, you know, how do we uphold the, the standard of performance that we've been watching? And then how do we create the, you know, or sort of like work with this material, which is so imaginative, that's based on these real people. And by the time we come to play them, there's this, you know, because because season five is set in the 90s, there's this incredible wealth of archival footage that we have access to. Should we wish to go into that, which it kind of is like a whirlwind and it's sort of like an abyss because it would go forever if we, and in a way I did get sucked into that. And then you have to draw yourself out because you have to come back to the place of ownership and imaginative material and what is yours to create and 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 I think the conversations that we had in going into it and, and but I, guess, I suppose it was also clear for me from what to me from watching it is that it's never been about likeness or mimicry it's it's about um I guess essence and and watching people sort of be possessed by these people and and it's also funny to do this show in England. I'm not I'm Australian, but there's there's a there's a kind of funny line between um, who who has ownership over these people as well, and especially now getting into this season because 
a lot of people are playing people who are still alive or people who, you know, they have very strong memories of. And yeah, so it was, it was a highly complex task for sure. Uh, uh, I can only imagine. I mean, you're playing like next to like Elvis or Marilyn Monroe, someone who is just so iconic. And mm. Elizabeth, I'm just really curious, like what were some of the things you avoided when it came to playing her so you could really just capture the humanity of Diana? One of the things when when I went into this job and actually COVID played a big part as well because I had a lot more time than I've ever had to prep something. All of a sudden, it was, you know, we were supposed to shoot it. I think we were supposed to shoot it maybe midway through 2020. And, and then all of a sudden it was sort of like a year to yeah. read, mm. which again is a sort of funny pacing game because you can't, I think all actors know that weird sort of trade between readiness and openness and preparedness, but it's it's a funny dance. So when you have all this time, like I really had to kind of move move through that. But I read a lot and I watched a lot, and there's this this enorm like enormous amount of material available to us that this research department sort of give to you. This amazing woman named Annie zoomed me, and she was sort of like, well, "How much of it do you want?" And I was super nervous and keen, so I was like, "I want all of it." To be real. Yeah. And then, of course, then it lands on my doorstep and it's literally just like volumes and volumes and archival boxes that you could spend like 20 hours watching it. You wouldn't get through it. And so um, one of the things that became clear to me, though, with with Diana, sort of things written about her is that um, there's strong agendas there. And it's also about history and sort of who who owns the truth of it and who decides who somebody was. And And there's also a lot of um, collective consciousness to wade through, a lot of sort of like possession of this person and what she means and how memory kind of obscures and how much people needed of her to become a certain thing. So, you know, one of the things that I learned very quickly was that I couldn't really read anything people had written about her because mm. I'd sort of get half of the book and then I'd, I'd feel like I'd pull up from it and think, well, how, that's, how de- you don't know that, you know, and so I'd become very, very defensive of her and sort of, realized that there was obviously an agenda and the agenda is to sell a book based on whatever angle. So the things that I started looking for were the most raw versions of footage I could get, which is usually sort of uncut newsreels. Yeah. A crazy person watching somebody get out of a car like 75 times. You know, exactly. Like yeah. little I'm, baby I have a question. This is just so fascinating because, it, you know, as an actor, you're kind of, you're taught not to be self-aware you're, or to lose mm-hmm. self-awareness mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and, and playing like a real person, it's interesting because you're forced to be like, to mim- not, I don't want to say, you don't want to mimic that person, but you want to become mm-hmm. that person so much that you're replicating that mm-hmm. moment in time. And, and how, how is that like in terms of the psyche as an actor, I'm just really interested in in that. I think I don't really always know how to talk about this because it was, um, you, it's funny, it, it all happened within a swamp of terror as well, like a swamp of extreme terror that was linked to a, a sense of responsibility. But so that sort of blurs a lot of the memory of the process of it. But But I think what I learnt was or what I figured out was that I had to spend so much time with it so I had to spend a, a really significant period of time with the material with both the script and and the footage I had of her so that I I think what I was after was a, was um, an ability to stop thinking really yeah. at all and so I think I was looking by osmosis to absorb enough. I remember thinking if I have enough sort of absorption somehow and if I've spent enough time technically figuring out how to do the vocal work and technically figuring out how to do the movement work, which is ex- just extremely kind of practical work, um, then when I step off the edge of the cliff, it's going to be there somehow. And what I what I knew that I didn't, ever want to feel was sort of frontal thinking somehow. But 
but I think it was it was really yeah it, yeah it was and it, but it was about you know like I had this weird luxury of time all of a sudden where I really could for six months like think and think and think and and um I think that's quite common on the crown this sense of like if I just absorb enough um I was talking to this very sweet girl Meg who plays Kate the other day and she sort of said the same thing you know she was like I just couldn't get enough of it before I started and it's mm. But maybe that's what it is. And, you know, we have very great people who, I'm talking so much, we have really great people who technically help us as well. So so you break it down into the technicality of the process, which is really like very, you know, what it's like learning a dialect. It's like you have to start from the most neutral place. And, and uh, yeah, I did my homework, a lot of homework. Is the really short answer to that <laughs> <laughs> the earliest amount of homework ever, ever. Yeah. Wow. That's a, thank you for that great question, Julia. Yeah, don't ask me to talk again today. I just, <laughs> just it, but you know what? It's just, it's such an interesting topic because I always think about it. It's like, isn't it nice as an actor to have the luxury of time, which you don't always get that because when right. you have a luxury of time, then you, by the time that you get on the set, then you can kind of throw everything out the window. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens when you have both actors like you, I'm not going to put myself in this narrative, but both actors like you, you know, with, with time, it, it, it's like a real luxury mm -hmm. for our artistry in a way, because then you kind of forget about it and can do whatever. And then because you're, it's so in you, you know, um, and it's going back to what you were saying, Elizabeth, that's, mm -hmm. so that's why you didn't have that self awareness. You, you could do that song and dance. Yeah. And I think also it's like the beauty of TV, right. Is that you spend enough time doing the thing. So like the, I don't know about you guys, but I, I imagine we're all pretty similar, weird creatures. Like the first few weeks of doing something is part of your brain that like really is just thinking the whole time, like, does anyone buy this? Does anyone see a person there? Because mm. I'm doing weird pieces, you know. And then you get to sit in it long enough, whether it's six months or whatever. And then if it's five years, you know, by the end of it, you don't care if anyone else buys it because it's yours. And But that takes time. You know, so Daya, I'm curious, you already talked about how COVID kind of shifted gears in, in terms of the storylines for season two of Euphoria. Like, did part of that course correction give you more time to, to, you know, just do what uh, Julie and Elizabeth are talking about, like really get, get the luxury of getting more into it this time. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's really, it's really special hearing you guys talk. So I'm like, I'm just like, oh, I love this, like keep going. Um, <laughs> um, but no, I, 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 I don't know, again, if you guys feel this way, but I also feel like when you live in a character so long or something about, there's like um, a special meeting with special characters of like yourself and them right and there's a little part of your soul that like clicks to them no matter how different and like I find that at least with Rue um it almost like she kind of steps in and I'm there and I know what's happening but like she is in control in this way and you know I've never really I hadn't before that experienced that feeling of like oh I feel at home in her Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like this safety in her. And I don't know if that has to do with, I think the safety that I feel on that set or the safety that I feel with my fellow actors that I get to work with or, um, or Sam or writer creator, like the, that feeling of like, you're good here. And like, you can go to the places you need to go to. And you're like, this is the place where your playground, where you can try things and you can feel safe to like look crazy or whatever, you know, um, I think that environment and, and feeling that space being allowed for me, um, allows Rue to just like do her thing. And I can feel her like, I, you know, like your whole body changes and you're just like, oh, she's here right now, you know, um, in the least <laughs> kind of strange way to speak about it. Um, the time between, like I said, things become so personal, um, to you and I find as well, like Rue feels like, I don't know if she's my little sister. I don't know if she's a, a part of myself or I don't know who she is to me exactly, but I know I care about her a lot, partially because I think she represents a lot of people that I think struggle with the same thing that she does. And so 
I, I can connect to the feeling of a tremendous amount of responsibility for her. Um, and I, I watch her make decisions and it breaks my heart to have to like live them out for her. Um, but it's, um, it's one of those things where I, I think I needed some time away from her in the sense that like I needed to pull myself and my personal feelings about who she is away because I think sometimes like again like I said earlier it's like you have this connection you care about them so much and you want people to care about them as much as you do and sometimes people aren't as forgiving or understanding of the things that she's going through and like I have to find a way to separate myself and let her belong to others and so the crazy thing about this season um this last season was you know we were editing uh, I remember I was recording a song for the for the editing process of the final episode finale episode while episode five was coming out. Okay. And that was like a really mm. trippy thing. Cause I was like, I'm still in it and it's mm. being digested. And I don't know how to like, to let go of her and let go of the feelings that I uh, have attached to her and my protectiveness over her, um, which I think ultimately is protectiveness over people who, who feel like her. And so I think that space between this first season and the second season, like gave me the space I needed to kind of come back into her a little bit more objectively. Um, and, um, and, and not so much from like this protective, I don't know, feeling that I was, I, I had over her um, and ultimately ended up being freeing again. Um, and also that time, like I said, there was a different season. Like we were going to shoot a very different season and I don't think we were ready. Wow. I, I had like a feeling inside. I was like, mm, I don't know. Like, it's just not what it needs to be. And, um, and so that time again, allowed us to experiment, to get outside of it and go back in it with a new set of eyes. And, um, and then we came back and it still changed. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. we were there and by the middle of the, the season, I remember we had finished this like really brutal episode and I was exhausted and Sam was exhausted. I was like, I've been crying, you know, I'm like beating myself up. And, and I just felt so deeply for like this position that, that she was, that Rue was in. Right. And I just was like, we had a very different ending of the show it was going to be a lot more uh, like devastating. And both of Sam, Sam and I, we got on the phone and we were like, I don't think we can leave her here. Like, I don't think this is what, we need to feel, but it's also not what she deserves. And it's also not like what the world needs to feel right now. Like, I think we've all collectively been through enough. And I, I think that such a, a topic or like a, without being corny or whatever, an overarching theme of the season was this idea of like, of hope and this idea that there can be a light at the end of the tunnel and you aren't you know, the worst mistake you've ever made, you know, and this idea of redemption and that she is worth love and she is worth having a beautiful life. And she isn't defined by like the darkest moment. And we didn't, we just didn't feel that it was right to, to keep her there because I think there's a lot of people that are looking at her and, and rooting for her. And I think they deserve to um, see her succeed. And I think brought me a lot of, it always brings me a lot of comfort knowing that Sam, like Rue is based off Sam. So Sam is our writer, creator and Rue, he struggled with addiction as, as a young person and has been clean since he was 19. And so Rue is very much a personal extension of himself. And um, he is now, you know, done such beautiful things with, with his pain and um, with his story and his life and, and, I feel like, you know, if he was able to turn this into something beautiful, I think Rue has the capability to do the same if she has that in her as well. So I'm very glad that season changed uh, and we ended on a much um, uh, more hopeful note. And um, yeah, I'm, gr I'm grateful for the, for the time away from it. Um, and, you know, I guess things happen for a reason, you know. I just got to say, Zendaya, that after that full body workout of season two, particularly <laughs> this episode, oh, having, having that cool down period with a, with a smoothie at the end of the eighth episode was exactly what we needed. Um, yeah. You know, you know, Julia, uh, I got to say that, that, you know, Zendaya brought up a really great point about coming back to a season 
after having time off and looking at the character objectively, now that you had done this, you know, four times, you know, three times with each new season and having time away and doing other work that you've been recognized for as well, you know, coming back into season four, how did you look at Ruth objectively? That's one. And second is how did you sort of feel at home and comfortable with playing her, especially during the filming of a season, which was probably challenged by, you know, COVID challenges. Right. And I also, there was a period of time where it was pre-vaccine on top of it, where I was filming Ozark and Delvey at the same time. Oh my God. (laughs) And it was like, it was actually like, I I don't think I will ever recover from that period of time, Um, but it's okay. You know, the show, show must go on. Right. But but going back to what you were saying, Zendaya, and you put it, it's, you articulated it so well, is when acting comes from like, it's like fear based in a way, like you, you have the first season, it's like your own world, there's no mm-hmm. audience. And then the second season comes in and these opinions come in and right. And, and you can't not care as an actor. That's just not realistic. We need an audience. It's not like we can paint by ourselves. This is an art form where you need an audience. So you're going to have that. You're going to be kind of like, I don't want to say codependent, but codependent on, 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 the, on the audience in a way. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it was, it was really challenging because, you know, People, you hope that people don't change, but that they grow. And it's the same thing with characters that you play on for many years. It's like, okay, well, how, what can I do differently, but also not change the the character? And I think, I think for Ruth, the, the big thing was that in a weird way, she was always very hopeful. She always thought that she was going to get out of, her situation. And I think her cousin Wyatt was her beating heart. And when he died, that heart just stopped and it was like guttural and it was, um, her soul died. She was like present, but her soul died in that episode. And then And then so and then episodes that happened in episode seven and then episode eight from episode eight to the last few episodes, she was kind of already dead before she even. Wow. Mm, wow. Her, her, her soul left her body, but her body, not to get really dark, but her body was her on this earth, but everything was gone. Wow. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. And, you know, because the season was broken up into two. Yes. I absolutely noticed a big difference in Ruth in the second half of the fourth season. Yeah. Cause she died already. Yeah. And wow. I and it was kind of like when I prepped, I knew that she was going to go um by like the first month of filming and I remember filming it and the the energy that I wanted to give that the audience weren't going to even be aware until way later was it sounds so dark but when when somebody like when somebody passes away and you just remember when they pass away and it's sudden and you have that certain last memories and you're like, wow, I didn't know that that was going to be the last time I saw them. That was kind of the whole energy that I wanted to give the season without the audience even really, sorry, I get emotional talking about it, but really know, knowing it in a way. Oh, oh, sure. Conscious, you know? Wow. Uh, I mean, seriously, Zendaya, uh, Julia, both of you, went through the ringer <laughs> um with the even on comedy i don't know i i say this and i i truly mean it we, we should all <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody listening i'm uh, watching you heard her uh you know elizabeth i want to ask uh again kind of going back to to just sort of not only uh picking up a character that was played uh previously in the in the in the previous season but you know like whatever corinne did with Diana was, was, you know, took it to the character as far, as far as it could go. And then, you know, you're coming in evolving further. So what did you sort of, sort of see in Emma's performance to, to use that as a springboard to go further and farther for yours? 
It's really funny. It's not, that's not really how I ever thought about it. Like I, when I watched Emma, I watched it in a, in a funny way, in the same way I've watched Zendaya's work or Julia's work. I watch it as an actor, just extremely kind of, just so curious about choices and so moved by choices. And, and, and I watched both the technicality be so proficient, but also the sort of like beautiful fluidity she had and the vulnerability and the openness. And I think I always knew that there was going to be a separation just inherently in a sense of age with the two Dianas, but it would have been too hard for my psyche to sort of think, I have to take that and and do something bigger or different. Or I really allow myself to just say that was that and it was extraordinarily beautiful. And now I have to sort of create a character almost as if she has a different name. You know, it's like I really had to build it from scratch. And I think I think that was also my joy as an actor because there's so much character, there's so much already attached to that character person even just the delineation is really complex even when I've talked about it in press it's super complicated because you <laughs> you're yourself saying Princess Diana and then you think oh no that's wrong I've got to say the character or Peter's creation or the interpretation of so there was already so much attached to it and I think I thought well if I'm going to get a joy or a freedom out of this which is something I desperately needed that I'm going to sort of have to psychologically think of building something from the ground up like I always do as an actor but that in itself is a really interesting process because um, it became clear to me really early on that when you create a character especially something that no one's ever seen before as in not an adaptation of something or something from a book or you, you know, one of the glories of that is that you are the author of it and you have this kind of ownership over it, you know, and you are the authority on who this person is, on how they feel, on what they think, on how they move. That's your creation. And so I guess I was working very hard to try to keep my Diana mine, you know, and think, well, I have to, I have to still allow myself psychologically to be the authority on this. And that was really one of the challenges because for a long time, I didn't feel like that, you know, and so I sort of wanted to work like backwards to get to a place where I thought, where I could do what actors do and stand in front of a director and say, I don't, you know, this doesn't make sense to me or like, I don't understand why she's saying that or why, she, maybe she ate that, but I, but I don't want to eat, you know, and so it was, to, it's almost like I had to sort of pedal backwards somehow to get back to that like Genesis place where, where I could pull the strings. And so, yeah, so that's, you know, and Emma and I didn't really speak a lot until afterwards because I had to keep it somehow. I mean, the, the task was too mammoth and like there were so many voices already in, in the conversation. And so I, I think I constantly had to sort of do this like very intense blinker work to just go, I have to just create this somehow for myself. And yeah. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So Zadea, you get the screenplay. For Stand Still Like a Hummingbird. You read it for the first time. And what is your reaction? What is your What are your thoughts about how you are going to approach Rue in this landmark episode? And what were the discussions you had with Sam Levinson to go there? Um. Oh man. Um, you know, it's <laughs> funny. So I talk about the script changing so much. This was one of the few episodes that didn't change that much. So I always knew we called it the room run and we always knew that that was coming. Like I always knew that at some point I was going to have to do this episode. And I think I was really terrified and it, it just stretched out the time in which I was to be terrified because we did a table read for it. Like I said, a year before we actually ended up ever getting around to, to actually doing it. Mm. Um, no, I mean, it's, I mean, it scared the shit out of me, to be honest. Um, and I just, I wanted to, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's scenes in the first season that, that touch on that, but this was like a whole different thing. And um, I was scared and I was, um, I just so wanted to, to, to do right by, by the pain. I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but like, I, I just, 
I knew that we had to go there because I think that um, to shy away from the tremendous amount of pain that she's in or um, that she's inflicting upon the ones that she loves, I think would be a disservice to, to her story. And I think it became our mission to see how low can we go and have, st- and have people still root for her yeah. and still care for her and love her. Um, because I feel like if you test that empathy in a fictional sense uh, with a character that people love and are somehow able to still love them by the, by, by the end, right, by episode eight, then we will have done our job because I think it hopefully will allow people to extend that same empathy in reality to real people that they know. Um, so I, I think when tackling that, I think I was just, I was terrified. Yeah. I was, uh, (laughs) I was nervous. I was doubting myself a lot, but like I said, I'm very grateful for, um, the environment in which I was given to, to do my best work. I feel so loved on that set, um, and, and, and protected. And I think, you know, Sam always finds ways to, um, to challenge me, (laughs) which is why I'm grateful to work with him because he sees things that sometimes I'm not really quite ready to see for myself. Um, and, um, and challenge me to do things that I'd be, you know, otherwise terrified to take on. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, the space was so, was so special. I think I've also spent an entire season prior with this crew, yeah. with these people. Um, so they've seen me, you know, in all my ways, um, you know, for, for a long time already. And, and many times, you know, I, I found that like, um, people would cry with me. Like I would hear little sniffles and things, which I felt like I wasn't quite in it alone, which felt really special. And, um, and there's like, literally there was a, there, they made the set basically so that I could, we just put it on Marcel, who was our, our, our incredible cinematographer. We, he put it on his shoulder and we just were like, okay, roll until it rolls out. They lit the whole um, house um, so that I could just go through and they made, everything like they're like you can destroy whatever you want because i remember the first season i broke something and everybody freaked out and they're like okay you're gonna hurt yourself so like we gotta make sure everything is safe and they're like you can break whatever go for it i wasn't supposed to break the door but you know things (laughs) happen (laughs) but you know um that scene was unbelievable i watched it that 10 minute i watched it twice like and i rewind it because it was just it, I mean, when we were talking, we're talking about self-awareness. I mean, there was no self and there was no self-awareness, but you were in total control of the scene at the same time. And it was, it was just, it was just, it, it was just like, oh, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's a pro. I mean, it was just, it was impeccable. It was just truly beautiful to watch. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy you asked that question because I was thinking about that too. I was like, oh, I hope he asks that question because that <laughs> scene is is such a state. I mean, it's 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 undescribable. It's impeccable. So I, yeah, Zendaya, I, 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 I got to ask you, Zendaya, <laughs> I got to say that scene, uh, honestly, just like Julia, I, I, you know, watched it when it first aired, you know, dropped and then you know, to prep for this conversation, I went back and I rewatched that episode again. Uh, in addition to all the points that you made, Nika King is equally spectacular. Uh, the, the prep for that that scene, like, how did you prep? Like, like the work together, elevate each other. I mean, so yeah. much. I'm so great. I'm and I'm glad you you mentioned Nika. I'm so grateful for Nika. I'm grateful for Storm. Those are my 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 set family. They're <laughs> real family. And like I said, it's that sense of like safety, right? That you know that like you're like I'm. And I felt so bad, like because I, I, I had to speak terribly to people that I really love and I really care about, and it made me feel so terrible. And, um, you know, some of it was written, but some of it was not. And I just, you know, when you finish those things and you just are able to go up to them and say, you know, I love you. They say, I love you. You hug each other and you're like, this, I'm so sorry. 
we're going to do this again, but I love you. And don't forget that I love you, you know? Um, and that's kind of how it felt. And I go back to like feeling safe or feeling whatever, you know, there was, there would be, like you said, this idea of like spontaneity and, and I didn't want the scene to just kind of be yelling the whole time. And I think there's a, there's a real, um, someone in that position uh, that Rue's in at that moment, there's a real volatility, like there's a real scary up and down, not really knowing what the next thing is going to happen because she'll say something and then immediately regret it and then immediately do it again. And it's like this thing of you never quite know what she's going to do to you. Is she going to hit you? Is she going to like, and we wanted to kind of keep that because that is, that is true to the, I think the, the mind 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 of of an addict and where she is in that moment in her life and feeling very like betrayed and backed into a corner um and that pain ends up just bleeding on everyone that she loves and ultimately scarring them in the process and i think it's so important to to highlight that addiction doesn't just affect the person who's who unfortunately is 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 suffering from it but also the people who love them um and I mean, they are a dream to be around and to work with. Um, and I'm grateful for their, <laughs> um, their patience. Um, but it, it, there was like a time where I, 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 I was sitting in the hallway and Sam's monitor is like behind the, one of the walls. He like, he was like in the kind of closet mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the house set. And um, so I could hear him and he would start calling out lines to me to say and and he then he started crying and then I'm crying and it's like this and I can hear that he's saying things that I think are deeply personal to him and like say and I'm like kind of becoming this catharsis for him a little bit to let these things out and these feelings and these fears that Rue you know is is, is are very real to her at this moment and yeah, it was, uh, um, it was exhausting, <laughs> you know, it was absolutely exhausting, but, um, but again, I think I couldn't be more grateful for the people that I got to share that space with. And I think the greatest gift from all of that is, and I say it all the time and I don't want to, you know, just sound like a broken record, but, um, the stories that people have shared with me after that season came out, I think, has been one of the greatest honors of my life. Um, mm -hmm. Just knowing that I have been able to be a part of someone's healing um, or help people maybe navigate uh, a traumatic moment in their life or feel that maybe they aren't the only one who has this pain or maybe, you know, they aren't the only one who feels this way um, has been so, so special. And I think that ultimately has become a part of Rue. Everyone I meet, like those stories, like they go into her and I, I cherish them and I honor them um, because I think ultimately what we do as storytellers, hopefully at the end of the day, is uh, to help people feel seen um, and to acknowledge people's existence you know yeah. um which sometimes is all you really need to feel um so yeah i don't know i am um, uh, very grateful for for that episode i think i learned a lot um in that process and um yeah i don't know yeah. Yeah. I, I seriously, I was, when I was watching it the first time, I just, when it was over, I was, I was like, I, I, I just stayed, stayed in place for a while. I just needed to like process everything. Cause it was really just took so emotional, you know, Julia, the scenes in Ozark, and this is, this has happened with in, in an increasingly geometric way from season one to season four, when you put Ruth and Wendy bird, in a scene together, it's like, uh oh, here we go. <laughs> you can cut the tension with a buzzsaw. Um, you know, working, you know, with Laura, you know, and Jason through these seasons, and you know, Zendaya, you know, you talked about about trust and and being in a safe place. 
How does that trust and being in a safe place with these actors you've worked with now for four seasons just take you to a to another level? I mean, I just that question is just activating my brain so much right now because and what you were saying, Zendaya, it's so true because if you as an actor, I mean, for me at least, but I feel like every actor is like this. It would be surprising if they're not. If you're not feeling safe. And if you don't feel that safety, you're just, you're walking with your skin inside out in a way. It's just, you're like a raw nerve and it's, it, it feels humiliating. And otherwise, if, if, even though it's not a fact, it feels like that. So it's like, you have to feel safe because if you don't feel safe, you're just going to feel judged. Mm. In and um, that's the worst feeling because when you have the judgment, then you have shame and shame is the worst feeling. So it's, it's, it's all of these things. And then with the shame, then you have the self-awareness and that goes against everything of what we do is, you know, lose all the self-awareness. So I'm able to go to those places. You were able to go to those places when you were doing the scene, you were able, you both were able to go to the places that you needed to go because you had the safety um, and you felt like you weren't being judged in a way. Um, so that was a big thing. I mean, you know, one thing when everybody talks about the scene in episode seven, that that's the, that scene with Ruth, I feel like so many people are like, how was it that day? And it's like, I have the same answer. It was a terrible day to film. It was traumatic. I had to completely put my body in like a trauma state, disassociation, like all these things. And, and, um, you know, but if I didn't feel safe, I wouldn't be able to expose that side of myself, which I would never tap into every day, you know? Um, you know, so I got to give it to the, to of course, Jason and Laura, and I love them so dearly, but also the crew that I've worked with for so long. Um, and yeah, I, that, that I felt safe and, um, you know, because it's, it's, it's a weird feeling. I, you know, when you completely expose yourself like that and then everybody's like, wow, that was amazing. I mean, that's the last thing I feel like hearing. Cause I feel like, <laughs> playing with like a piece of shit. Like I'm just like mm -hmm. out of here. Like I just want to hide because I felt embarrassed in a way. It's so exposed. I mean, was it weird for you to watch that scene in a way? Cause I felt like, not that it was similar, but I, it, it, it had, when I was watching that, it had that, I could totally tell like, okay, the prep was really hard. This was a day where it felt like you were like a raw nerve, like how I'm just curious. Cause I felt like so crappy that I, everybody's like, that was great. I'm like, it was a terrible day. <laughs> I hated it, but you know, it, but, but yet it was kind of fun. Now <laughs> that's what I live for too. So it's, it's weird. It's a weird song and dance. Like I, I guess I love being uncomfortable as an actor. I don't know. It's very complicated. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So Dave, what do you think? Do you like being uncomfortable as an actor? <laughs> you know what's so funny? So here's the thing. I think why I love my job is because in real life, I am such, I'm a Virgo and I'm like super self-critical, super like, you know, hard on myself, super controlling. And I think this is the one thing in my life where I can be like, you know what I mean? And just be like, I'm letting go. Like, this is what I'm doing, you know, and, and feel that, that real freedom. Um, so I think in many ways, I think it's like, um, it's therapeutic because any pain that I have, I let Rue have, um, and she becomes my catharsis and my outlet and also like a way of like, you know, maybe dealing with my own stuff or dealing with my stuff with my loved ones, like through this situation. Um, um, but also like, so it feels freeing. It feels liberating and, and exciting. But then also like, like you're saying, like, I feel icky. Like I feel gross about, you know, um, the things I've said or the things that like I've, 
because uh, you know I, we we put ourselves in these kind of ridiculous situations. I mean, there it's absurd. <laughs> it's insane. It's absurd. And, <laughs> yeah. and, <laughs> but like your brain knows it's not real, but right. your body doesn't really know that it's not real. You know what I mean? Like you're like, no, I know that I'm not. You know, like I'm not really rude, right? And this isn't really happening, right? But then but you're going through the same things and, and, and it feels very visceral and it starts to kind of go into you a little bit and that, um, well, a lot of it. And, and yeah. that's when, <laughs> you know, it, it, it starts to feel like you're saying like a, a walking nerve or, or a very scary yeah. and in you. Um, so much. That's yeah. in you. You just, it's, it's just becomes, it's like I kind of view, for me at least, Ru- like Ruth. I was about to say Ruth. Wow, but Ruth <laughs> is, um, is is such a big chapter in. I look at people like books in a way. It's like everybody has chapters in life, and I feel like yeah. Ruth for me is such a big chapter in my life. A very important chapter. Of oh, sure, mm. sure, absolutely. You know, and, I, and going back to like what you're saying, sorry, uh, but like watching it back, I think I, I had this weird thing where I was a part of the editing process. Mm. So that is weird because, again, like you're saying, like we've talked about this idea of like stepping outside of yourself and then like acknowledging some things and being able to like remove yourself a little bit. And I don't, I don't really have a problem watching, watching things back. I did feel, you know, like a little bit like, Ooh, that's not nice. Like that, that doesn't feel great. Um, but it was strange because I then put like a different hat on and was like, Oh, that's a better take or oh, that's whatever, which is like a weird, like kind of impersonal way to look at it. So I don't know. It was like, I didn't, ever just have like a viewing of it right it was more like piecing uh, piecing it together and mm-hmm. figuring out what works from this very emotional raw thing and it's like I don't know how um I I got to experience it necessarily sure sure yeah uh, Elizabeth I was in uh, I was in London in November of 1995 for about a month for work that was the month that was when that interview aired and to be in mm. the UK, to be in London. I mean, uh, you know, I was 25 years old. I was like, holy moly. It was also when the Beatles anthology came out. So that was actually pretty cool. But Elizabeth, so I don't think the microscope was ever bigger over Diana than during that month, during that interview. And, mm. you know, we've been talking about trust and being going to a, going to that place and, you know, you're working with Peter Morgan, uh, the actor who plays Bashir. Uh, like, how did you, like, feel like you were able to get to that point with Diana? Well, I just want to say, first of all, that was an extraordinary conversation to listen to between the two of you. And I just think you are both absolutely masterful, just masterful. And just to watch both of what you did in those roles, like, and knowing it's so funny watching things as an actor because you feel the cost of it and you know how it lives in your body, but you, you're both extraordinarily generous with what you gave in those roles. And I just think it's a funny thing that people don't always know what that is that day, that cost. And it's, it's astounding what you did. And it's the kind of work that when you watch it and you turn it off and you walk outside, something shifted in you. That's like, that's great work. You know, like there's, Something has shifted because you've you've learned something about the human condition. Okay. The, okay, now back to your question. <laughs> um, Beautiful. Um, the, yeah, the panorama was a, a really wild thing to do. It was really kind of interesting that we had all this information that was relatively fresh about, I forget the name of the report, about Bashir's... Um, about the way the interview was obtained. And it was quite, it was quite recently sort of learned by the public. I think, I think when I came back to London to shoot season five, there was, I've been there a few days and there was a documentary about um, that sort of uncovered the whole Bashir process of, of the manipulation and the lying about the bank statements and the forgery and da, da, da. 
So as a, as a public, we kind of learned that here and it was shocking to me. And then of course, Peter kind of took everything he was learning in the research department was learning because um, that was a big report and it un, yeah, really uncovered some pretty incredible things. But um, again, it was twofold, which I think the Crown always is in a way. It's, it was, um, it, you know, it was, it was a study of that interview. And so I had to sort of break it into two places. Like, what is it about that interview that affected why did it affect people the way it did and why did it have the knock-on effect? I mean, it was a highly kind of politically charged um, ramifications, which, of course, the real tragedy of the interview is, as far as I can tell from the sort of timeline, is it was really the, the catalyst for her being really, ex, um, you know, sort of separated from the royal family, losing protection, and which left her in the incredible vulnerable state she was at the end of her life. I could get in a lot of trouble for saying this. Maybe that's politically incorrect, but that's why. I'm always scared of getting in trouble from the British press. <laughs> um, but uh, so, um, so that, what I, I mean, one of the things I did was really ask people, like people like yourself, if they brought it up, or my you know, family or friends who live here and, and said, like, what do you remember about watching it and what did it do to you? Why, like, why was it so impactful? Was it at all? And um, I asked a lot of women what it meant to them and their memory of watching it. And I had like a, an extraordinary kind of like collection of, of, of like very physical responses to it, which then I had to work out like, why did it hit people? It was so guttural. And like, mm. there was this, this combination of like shock, I think. Mm. Um, uh, and then I think fear of what would happen as a result and also kind of collective it's a very British thing, this sense of like, don't, don't, um, and my mum always said, don't air out your dirty laundry. Like, don't, like, keep it to yourself. But it happened at this, like, time in, in the kind of media battle between Princess Diana and, and Charles, the, King Charles, the, see, I'm terrified all the time, um, that uh, they were sort of pitted against each other. And he actually did an interview first and, it was this kind of very PC, I guess, in a way, interview and um, sat down and sort of admitted to the adultery. Then we have the revenge dress, that's the timeline. And then so I think everybody just thought she was just sort of maybe attempting to get back at. So it felt kind of tit for tat. And within that framework of viewing it like that, then I think judgment sort of spewed forth the sense of like, she didn't need to, it wasn't appropriate, nobody needs to know those things about you. And it's, it was funny to me in a way because one of the things that I always thought she was extraordinary for and now even more so believe that, that um, she was really in an age that was so pre sort of anyone doing this, uh, I mean, pre social media, pre everything, she really sort of decided to use a platform to talk about um, the psychological issues she was going through, whether it was bulimia or postnatal depression or, or just the sort of internal workings of the firm as you know, she called it, and that was unprecedented. No, but nobody had done that. So I, I had somebody tell me once that they watched the interview from behind a couch, that they just couldn't do, you know, they were just like this the whole time. And that was so interesting to me because I thought, wow, that just hit you so hard as a, you know, woman in, in your 20s. Um, and then and then we learn everything. This is so long. Then we learn everything about the Bashir interview, and we learn that there was this enormous manipulation that happened, and and a sense of somebody being a journalist, a person being um, very, very good. Perhaps why they're very good at their job at reading people, at understanding the vulnerabilities, at learning like how to, where to press the finger in the thing, you know, in, in the wound. And her wound was obvious. I think it was obvious to the public, and it was certainly obvious to anyone who was looking that there was enormous amount of paranoia and a lot of it was founded um, we sort of later find out and yeah she was deeply manipulated into it so then you know and then also I watched it a hundred thousand times <laughs> I watched it a hundred thousand times in many ways I learned that um, I had to watch it but then I learned that I had to just listen to it because she's performing something as well and so there's this element of her and that happened by accident. I was trying to cook and then I was like cooking something and I had it going in the background. And then I heard, I heard a line that I'd watched a hundred mm. times. I heard it and went, 
oh, wait a minute, there's two completely different things happening here. Wow. 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 So then I sort of went, and also then I'm standing with my phone and going, oh, shit, now there's like even more to it. Um, <laughs> but, but it was fascinating. It was a totally fascinating acting experiment. I loved doing it. I'm, um, it, was a, it was a really strange day. I came to work and the set was identical to what I'd been watching on my screen. Oh, very wow. Very arrangement. And we had these big old 90s cameras, these huge big cameras that were filming us so that the cam- our very modern camera could sort of pan over. And uh, that was the only time playing this role that when I saw myself through a 90s lens, I went, oh, wow, that, that works. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought of that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was very interesting. And I think everyone was very nervous because it's a um, very politically charged thing to um, tackle. But we also felt it was very necessary because, uh, because of the information that we'd learned, you know, in the last sure. year of shooting it, that um, Peter really wanted to tell that story. And, and I hope that it had some effect in rewriting people's sense of um, why she did it and we were all very nervous, and then this has never happened to me before. But I did one take, and Peter bur- burst into the room and started clapping, and it was the weirdest thing I've ever. And I remember thinking, "Well, that's good," but now I have to do it fifty-two times. So, um, <laughs> but no, but that didn't give me confidence because it really was one of those weird, almost like floating through space moments where you just do a thing, and then it lands, and you think mm. Oh, mm. anything, you know. But I think everyone was a little bit wigged out by it so and Prasanna who plays Bashir was also kind of extraordinarily uncannily good and um yeah yeah but that was a challenge yeah so so last question for each of you as we as we part from this conversation and I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow a word uh, Elizabeth that you used the word is shift shift so starting with you you, Zadea what shifted in you as an actor and maybe as a musician by playing Rue on Euphoria? I, I honestly feel like I, uh, I'm a com- I feel like I'm not a completely different person from when I started Euphoria, but I, I definitely feel like I've changed immensely as a human being. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say I was judgmental in any way, but I think I, my heart is like way more, open (laughs) and way more sensitive and way more fragile um in a lot of ways I definitely think that you know um before (laughs) before and after euphoria um before I, I don't know I just felt like I think a lot more I don't know I didn't wear my heart on my sleeve as much maybe um nor did I fully understand or um, have the right knowledge to understand um, the experience of addiction. And um, I think I'm so grateful, like eternally grateful for, for Euphoria and to Sam and uh, for just uh, teaching me to, you know, um, not be so afraid to open my heart more and, and, and feel uh, and not be afraid of feeling. Um, and, and I think it's expanded. I would consider myself an empathetic person and somehow I feel like I have become even more so. Um, mm-hmm. um, and I think that that's a, that's a great thing. I would love to become a more empathetic person. And I think that, you know, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a good thing to have taken from this. Um, and um, that is what has shifted. And I think a million things have shifted in me. Um, my perception of myself, um, my, and my own, um, thoughts on my own capabilities, you know, or, um, what, uh, what have you, but I, I just think it, it, it cracked my heart open in a big way. Um, and let a lot of beautiful things in, I think in the end. And I'm, and I'm really, really grateful for that experience because as I said before, the kind of person I am being that I am, um, not a control freak, but you know, um, control freak adjacent. Um, (laughs) it has, 
offered me this really, this, this really beautiful kind of um, look at life, I think in, in this way. And, and I've been able to meet such beautiful people through this. I've been able to learn um, their stories and um, connect with people um, in a deeper sense. And really that is the most important thing about all of this um, is the humanity aspect. And um, uh, in the best way, um, I, I won't, I won't say any of the negative euphoria effects um, because I really think the the good outweighs anything else. Like I'm it's, I couldn't be more grateful for, for that show um, and for the opportunity and the honor to, to play, to play that character. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of shifting, still shifting. Still you shifting, know, sure. third yeah. season, there's going to be some more shifting. Like it's, it's an always process. I think that's what we are as humans anyway, you know, we're ever shifting, um, beings. So that is absolutely true and beautifully said. All right, Julia, <laughs> what shifted in you after four seasons with Ruth? Oh man. Well, I can't follow up after that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what shifted? I mean, you know, I started the show when I was 22. So I spend majority of my twenties with that character. Um, I grew a lot since then, I guess, or there, there was a lot of changes in my life, but I think, I don't want to say a shift more as a discovery. I feel like that's a, a better way to put it. I, I I feel like for this is, you know, before when I, when I started acting, I always was looking at, you know, obviously you want to play interesting women. You want to play interesting characters and interesting people, but now I'm kind of, I'm more interested in, you know, how can I move people? How can I, and it goes back to what Elizabeth was saying of you sometimes watch somebody's performance and it, you have a physical reaction and that's moving from within. So that's what I'm interested in. How can I reach, I want to reach people. And I feel like you know, acting and, and really storytelling is it's, it's not about the artist. It's really about the audience. It's, it's actually not selfish at all because it's about connecting with that person who is watching, who is, you know, you know, watching the movie, reading the book, looking at a painting, listening to the music. How are they, how are they reacting? Not how, how am I reacting? Yeah. yeah. With that. You know what I mean? Yep. So um, that's what I'm interested in. How, how can I affect people in a way? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, take us out, Elizabeth. What, uh, instead of the word shift, I like Julia's word much better. Discovery. What were the discoveries that you will take with you moving forward? Many plentiful discoveries. But I, I think for me, it's quite simple in a way that um, – and I'm still shooting season six at the moment, so I'm still, although it's slowly coming to an end, I think it's really a strange ex and beautiful experience playing a character that we know has a tragic end and that there's this inevitability of a thing that the person is moving towards, that you yeah. are living and they're living in you. And uh, I think that the real... I always say this, that you, you can't spend any time, I think, near that woman's spirit and not be profoundly moved by what I think of as a kind of love ethic. She was somebody who wanted to be loved so deeply and she had so much love in her and she loved so many people. And, of course, the effects of that still ripple consciously in our sort of collective consciousness today and unconsciously. And when we lost her, the world mourned in a way that's completely unprecedented. And you think, well, what did they lose? And I think they lost somebody who loved them. And of course, the sort of tragedy of the story, of her story is so much about the fact that that's what she wanted to experience. And I think, I think that being near that dichotomy for so long and it's been so deeply in my heart now that is a sense of um I just always think of this thing that she said which is if you find somebody who loves you 
don't let it go. You, know, you have to work very hard to keep that in. And it's worth fighting for and it's worth loving people. And I think this business is, is fascinating and difficult and challenging and is, oh, yeah. you know, such a gift to work as an actor. And, and at the same time, you can become tired and um, you, can, you can carry all this sort of funny ramifications of the job to the next job to the next job. And sometimes you, you have to sort of be reminded of this thing, which is that the ordinary is good and love is the thing, <laughs> in a sense, maybe whatever. But in a funny way, she just really woke me back up to that thing that um, I needed to hear, I think, really deeply. So, Wow. Wow. What a perfect way perfect way to end this conversation. I've been moderating a lot of these conversations for the SAG Foundation for, I don't know, like 15 years now. This is one for the books. Elizabeth, Julia, Zendaya, thank you so very, very much for an, an incredible conversation about these performances. Congratulations on your SAG Award nominations. All the best to all of you. Thank you, everyone, for watching the SAG After Foundation conversation. And until next time, be well and all the best. <laughs>